Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. This webinar is Best Practices for Patent Quality. Um, I'm your facilitator today. My name is Damian Durant. I'm VP of Customer Solutions at PatentBots. Uh, this webinar is co-hosted by the law firm of Harity LLP and PatentBots. We're very happy to be uh, working with them today. We have a tremendous panel for you. I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves and, and give some background. Uh, but before we do that, a couple of housekeeping things. So you can ask questions. We'd encourage you to do that. Please do. We'll do our best to get through those questions periodically. And there will also be two poll questions. Uh, I think you'll find it interesting. Please do answer. It's a chance to make your opinions heard and we'll share those results. And then finally, this will be available on demand from Zoom so you can watch it later as well. So Without further ado, um, I'm going to ask our tremendous panel of practitioners to introduce themselves. And Elaine, perhaps we could start with you. Thank you, Damien. Uh, my name is Elaine Spector, and I'm a partner at Herity and Herity. So welcome. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Herity and Herity is a prep and pros firm working exclusively exclusively in the electromechanical space. We're excited to talk about uh, the, the topic of patent quality, as it is one of our core values here in addition to innovation, people, and service. So a little bit about me. My background is in mechanical engineering. Um, I started my career in private practice and then moved in-house at Johns Hopkins Tech Ventures office for six years, and then ventured back into private practice with Harity and Harity about four years ago. So uh, excited to be here and talk about this topic. Thank you, Elaine. And uh, Bernie? Hi there. Uh, I am a... a, a I'm a counsel at McDermott, Will & Emery. I've been there for the past 21 years. Prior to that, I was a primary patent examiner at the USPTO. And then prior to that, I was working in industry primarily with, with electrochemical devices. I'm a chemical engineer by background. And uh, if you're not familiar with McDermott, we're a general practice firm. We, we dabble in everything. We have a very robust patent prosecution and litigation groups. Excellent, and, and Jeff. I'm Jeff O'Neill, uh, I'm the founder of PatentBots and I'm also a patent attorney. I've been practicing as a patent attorney for about 15 years and uh, I'm currently at uh, GTC Law Group. And my technical background is uh, in machine learning. I, I worked in the speech recognition industry for a while and uh, most of my clients are in the sort of the speech recognition machine learning space. Very good, and Michael. Thanks, I'm, I'm Michael Drapkin, a, a partner at Holland and Hart. We're a, an Anlaw 200 GP firm based in Denver. Uh, in my practice, we focus on patent prep and counseling and um, serve predominantly large technology companies. We've got a, a team of, of 60 practitioners uh, uh, doing this work. And we really use a systematic approach, invest heavily in automation and training. And this has led to some really great advances in quality and I'm, I'm excited to be here today. So thanks. Well, thank you to all the panelists for your valuable time today. So Jeff, let's kick off with you uh, a little bit about how this uh, webinar came about. Okay, uh, thank you, Damien. Yeah, so I thought it'd be helpful just to start with just a little background about how we came up with the idea to do a webinar on patent quality. And the inspiration was the patent bots quality scores uh, that many of you probably heard of. And what that is about is we downloaded an entire year of issued patents from the patent office. And then we proofread every single one of them. Um, you know, we're looking for things like numbering errors, antecedent basis errors, things like that. So we had all this really great data and um, we sort of compiled it and we, created a ranking of law firms based on the average number of errors in their issued patents. Uh, and there's about 800 law firms in, in the group and we published the, the top 50 publicly to sort of you know, commend these top 50 firms for doing really, really great work for their clients. Um, and in doing these quality scores, we got a lot of feedback from people that yeah, you know, this is certainly an, you know, one important aspect of patent quality, but you know, there's many, many other important aspects of patent quality that your quality scores don't address. Uh, and that's a completely valid criticism. You know, we're just addressing one you know, fairly specific part of patent quality. So we thought it'd be interesting to you know, look at the question of patent quality in more detail. 
Um, you know, for example, you know, what makes for a high quality patent? You know, I think there's a lot that goes into that and uh, it would be great to explore that today. And even more importantly, how does a law firm going about, go about obtaining uh, high quality patents? You know, that's not an easy thing to do. Um, so we contacted Harity and Harity. Uh, they're, they're one of our, our top uh, performing law firms in our quality scores. And, and uh, we got them on board to co-host this webinar with us. Uh, and we got a great panel today. Uh, I think it's great to mention that all the law firms uh, represented here today are, are the, in the top 25 of patent bots quality rankings. So that's great. And uh, I expect to see a lot of great insights um, from the panel. And with that, uh, I think we can go ahead and get started. That's great. So thank you, Jeff. So over to you, Michael, um, this, this thorny question of patent quality, I'll hand that off to you. Um, well, sure. And I, I think that patent quality matters. It matters a lot. Um, it's being measured by our clients and, and, and it's being used when they select counsel and it's, it's being used when they decide how much work they're going to send to us. So it's critical for that reason because we, you know, we're, we're, um, you know, we, we have um, mouths to feed and, and we want to um, bring, bring in as, as much work as possible. So quality matters for that reason. It also matters deeply to our clients. And, you know, 10 to 15 years ago, uh, we really began seeing a shift to fix fees. And it began um, kind of as a commodity uh, pricing tool. But as we all know, patent work is more than other legal work. It's made up of standardized tasks, and there are kind of consistent things about scope and time spent and quality that are, are you know, e easy, easy to, to make fixed fees about. So um, there's, there's increasing pressure on, corpor on corporations to, to lower costs, to raise quality. IP operations are really becoming much more sophisticated in the tools that they're using. So we're seeing um, fixed fees across the board. It's it's for you know the, the highest value work, um, and IP operations are are using the tools that that we're talking about today to measure which firms are going to get that work. So um, with that backdrop, we know that that's going to continue. They're going to continue to put pressure on you know uh, weeding out the firms that aren't using the tools. And so if you want to effectively compete in the future, I think. The tools that we're going to talk about today are, are critical to your success. And then what does the panel would like to weigh in on the, what Michael said? So I, I, I agree with Michael completely. Uh, the move to the fixed fee structure and that or that demand by our clients and an increased uh, quality. I, I can speak from being in house at six years and seeing the inconsistent drafts. Um, that were being submitted to me, the time I had to take to go through those drafts and, and the firms that were doing the work back then, really some of the most prestigious firms, it was just pretty shocking how different an application would be between attorneys working within that firm, even among the same attorneys, at the same attorney working on something. I don't know what I was gonna get. And so a lot of my time would be going through those drafts and it surprised me. So patent quality from the in-house perspective is very important because we had very limited time. I had 600 cases I managed. So I, I couldn't spend a ton of time going through applications that I entrusted my outside counsel to draft for me consistently with a high quality. So when I came to Heredy, I was really shocked to see the kind of processes and systems they had in place to make sure that they had a uniform and consistently drafted patent application. And we'll talk more about that through some of the tools and measures, uh, but it really was something different. And you know, patent quality is gonna differ depending on the client and every, every attorney will say something different. Um, but for me, from the in-house perspective, just the limited amount of time, it was, it was technology when we wanted to license to industry. So we were very important in claim scope and having an understandable technology. So from, our pers from that perspective, um, quality and consistent product was very important. I mean, are there specific dimensions of patent quality that, that we should probably at least touch on? Um, and this is, it gets a little bit philosophical, but anyone comment on that? Yeah, I think one, um, I think one very important dimension is uh, to make sure that you're, you're capturing the invention um, in the way that the inventors understand it and what they think is important to them. I think a big part of patent quality is, you know, having a drafting attorney uh, who knows the technology of the patent very well. 
um, because then they can use you know, the language and vocabulary of the inventors. So they, there's better communication. Um, and it also uh, makes it easier for the patent attorney to capture the invention at the right scope, right? Like we all wanna be aggressive and get you know, broad valuable patents, but you, know, you, you don't wanna to go too far over the line and, and get a patent that um, you know, could be invalidated or is in danger of being invalidated. So I think a patent attorney with the right technical skills can navigate those waters very well. And the other thing that I think is, is worth mentioning is just ensuring that you align the strategy of the patent application and the patent portfolio with the broader strategy of your client. We do a lot of work in the standard space and, you know, the work that we do for our, our, our key client in that area, we focus on different things than we would, uh, you know, a large software company or a semiconductor company. Uh, so I think a critical part is also um, honing that strategy to align with the needs of, of, the, of the team that you're serving. Okay, very good. Um, well, maybe we should move on then. So I think Bernie, you're going to address sort of um, from best practices point of view, what, what is being done at your firm to ensure that clients are getting high quality uh, work products. Yes, and uh, Jeff, I, I believe hit the nail on the head with the first point I was gonna raise that the, I, what I believe the most important uh, measure to obtain quality patents is to have the right person prepare the patent application. Uh, you know, it, broadly speaking, you have electrical, chemical, mechanical, and computer people. And uh, it, ensure, having the person with the right background prepare the patent application, as Jeff pointed out, that person speaks the same language as the inventor, understands the various acronyms that are used, uh, so that's, that's to, to have a deep bench uh, across all, all disciplines is, is the first step. Uh, the, second, the second most important thing is having someone who cares, actually. I mean, that's a, it's very centered on the drafter, but uh, I have, uh, it, and it's, it, some of this is very self-explanatory and some of it is uh, you know, instinctive, but you'd be surprised at, at, at what you get. Uh, just having someone who will proofread the application that they prepare. Some, some agents and attorneys will just rely on spell check and then hand me something to review. And I'm like, did you see what you wrote here? Uh, just, you know, did you even read this? So uh, that, that, that's a big with me. If, if, if someone doesn't care enough to proofread their own work, then, then those, those people don't, don't last long. Uh, now, as, as for ensuring patent quality, uh, it, at, at our firm, all applications, all newly prepared applications that we draft are, are reviewed, whether no matter who prepares it, whether it's partner level or associate level, agent level. So every, every patent is, is reviewed by at least one person at, at partner level. Uh, as for ensuring we have good responses, all all responses prepared by agents and associates are reviewed by someone at part, partner level before they go out. And for that matter, all anything we file at the patent office is, is reviewed by someone at, at partner level. Now, now to maintain patent quality over time, we have regularly scheduled uh, monthly IP group meetings where we'll discuss recent developments in, in case law, recent changes at with USPTO procedures, frequently we'll, we'll assign one of the attorneys to give a presentation on, on recent developments. So these, these type of things help, help ensure patent quality. Any other thoughts on that? I can talk a bit about what we do at Herity. Um, we do very similar to what uh, Bernie does um, with regard to the second attorney review. Uh, our second return of review is for all work product applications, as well as responses, not just for associates and patent agents, for everybody at the firm. Um, John Herity, Paul Herity, all, everybody's work is second attorney reviewed by a select group of attorneys with 20 years of experience in the patent field. So really, there are gatekeepers of quality uh, within our firm. Um, we also... <laughs> Really, to step back, um, Bernie, you were talking talking about having uh, attorneys that were that cared. 
And so at the hiring stage, we actually administer a writing test. I don't know if you've all heard about this writing test. It's very difficult to pass. And um, we try to hire superstars to start. So we started very early in the process. Again, we've got training. We've also developed a uniform writing style that ensures that the work product delivered to a particular client or in-house attorneys is consistent and reliable. That's what we're really shooting for. And we don't have attorney personal preferences, we have firm preferences. So like you, Bernie, we have these meetings to discuss and vet out what is the best language based on a new case. Um, we're very template driven. So we update our templates based on the language that we've agreed to as a firm. We have a dedicated client intranet site for each firm client and have preferences listed there for each firm client, as well as in-house attorney preferences. So I might like something a different way than one of my colleagues in-house. Uh, we've created and use uh, tools to assist ensuring the accuracy and consistency of the non-substantive parts of our application. I'll talk more about that in our tool sections with the patent drafter tool. And again, we use software tools to check for errors in our patent applications. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts on that? Yeah, I would, I, uh... Elaborating more on, on, on a point that, that, that Elaine brought up about uh, drafting applications. Uh, McDermott has, a, uh, has an outside writing coach that, we, that comes into our firm a couple times a year and you can make appointments with them and, and, and the coach is wonderful. I mean, I, 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 I had him review some of my appeal briefs and he, you know, even though he knows nothing about patents, he knows how to write. And uh, that's, that's one of the ways that, that, that we help improve quality. Very good. Um, so we do have a question. Um, and um, if the attendees can use the question uh, interface, that will make this a little bit easier uh, to do. The question is, which aspects of existing or future patent drafting tools excite you the most? So that's to the panel. Broad question, but... Uh, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I can jump in on that one. Um, I guess I'm sort of biased because um, I get really excited about natural language processing, machine learning, and things like that. And the technology in those areas is expanding so quickly. Um, neural networks are so much better than they were like 10 years ago, and they're continuing to advance at a pretty fast rate. Um, so I think as time goes on, we're going to see some really slick tools that can take advantage of you know, these latest machine learning algorithms. And you know, one of the best parts is um, you know, to do machine learning, you need lots of data. And in the patent world, there's so much public data available that I think we're gonna see a lot of cool things um, in terms of using all this data and the, and the latest machine learning technology to uh, really help with automating the tedious parts of the patent prosecution process. Anyone else on that? Um, so moving along, I think Elaine, you were going to address um, metrics and measurement a little bit, if you can. Sure. Uh, so uh, at Herity, we love to measure. We are all about data. So we've got an analytics team. Um, that's something that was different when I started. So with regard to um, the metric we use for quality, with regard to app, um, drafting our patent applications, we have a 44 point quality check on every patent application that's drafted. Um, here, here it is. We've got them all listed, everything that we check in on. Uh, for the prosecution, uh, uh, for every, we have a 33 point quality check on every office action response. As I had mentioned earlier, we have second attorney review for everything that we file at the patent office. Um, and uh, when the second attorney is actually reviewing it, they score the attorney. So we have a 15 or so factor scorecard for every single thing that we do. So as an individual attorney, it benefits not only the client at having a better work product, but as an individual attorney, as a partner, I'm still getting feedback for my pro product. I, I don't think that I, you know, we get to a point where we know everything, we can always learn. And so I personally enjoy getting feedback and saying, hey, you know, I might not have looked at it that way. Let's, you know, shift that around. So there's, it's a, it's a learning tool for us uh, within the firm. We also measure the, the quality of the work product that leaves the firm on the basis of how many times it was sent back. And so we phrase this as how many times do we get it right the first time quality metric, we actually track that. And we present that to the individual drafting attorneys. And so we want to make sure 
that we're not wasting our client's time in reviewing our drafts. We wanna make sure that there aren't these grammatical errors. There aren't any kind of typos or any kind of substantive issues with regard to our applications. As I mentioned earlier, we have a patent analytics team. We use that heavily in the prosecution space. Um, for example, how many office actions are there to an allowance? Um, do, should, um, how often are we using the AFCP procedure? And how often does that lead us to an allowance versus not? We're finding that if you file an AFCP, the chances are you're gonna uh, get to an allowance um, at a higher rate than you will without using it. So we use it unless, unless we can't use it. Uh, we track the number of claims in every application. Do, are we at the 20? Or did we cancel them and forget to add? We don't wanna leave anything on the table. We paid for a 20. We wanna make sure we get 20. As a former uh, litigator, I wanna make sure I have a scope of claims to proceed with. I want at least three independent claims and as many dependents as possible. Um, how successful are we after examiner interviews? We're tracking that. We're also tracking our pre-appeal brief and appeal statistics. And we also benchmark these against our competitors you know, we're like a little bit competitive at Heredity. I don't know if you all know that. We want, you know, of course we want to be number one. So we're tracking you all. We're, we're, we're benchmarking against you. And I think that makes for a, a better work product on, on our side. So those are some of the metrics that we are using. Is there any, any other thoughts on that from the panel? Yes. Uh, the, the, the metrics that, that you discussed, Elaine, uh, we have clients who, give us report cards based on many of those same metrics that you had mentioned, the claim count, uh, whether we use AFCP, our success after interviews, how many cases we interview, the number of actions before we get an allowance uh, with drafting, it's how many drafts go back and forth between the drafter and the inventor. And, and, and our client will send us a quarterly report card and then yearly send us a report card with how we rate against all their other firms. And uh, so all these metrics are always, always on our mind when, when we're preparing patent applications, because uh, you know, we like to maintain our standing near at or near the top of their list and not near the bottom, because ultimately it comes down to, you know, someone mentioned feeding your family is that if we're at the bottom of the list, next year we're not going to be on the list at all. So. Uh, that that those those are very very strong inducements to to maintain quality. Excellent. Well, we have a couple of questions actually that are starting to build up. So we got to address them. Um, one of them is um, how do you assess the strength of the patent application with respect to the chances it will be allowed in the first place um, and after it's allowed? Um, can someone address that? So how do you assess the strength of the patent application with respect to the chance that it will be allowed? That's a tough one. Um, yeah. I mean, honestly, I feel like as a patent attorney, you kind of get a pretty good sense for these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. like, like, you, like you start to know certain technology areas really well. You start to know like what the prior art looks like. And you can, mm -hmm. you know, even, you know, whether or not you do a prior art search, you, you know, you can still, get a pretty solid understanding of, you know, the odds of certain claims being allowed. Um, so it's not a great answer in that it's not something that's precise and measurable, but um, I don't know, I guess that's just from my, my experience as a patent attorney. Okay, and there's another one here. And that's, this question is a good segue into your you know, section, Jeff. So what are some of the more common errors in patent applications or problems that reduce patent quality that aren't typically detected by metrics? That's a, also a big question, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. I think the panel's thinking about that one. So what are some of the more common errors um, that reduce quality that aren't typically detected by metrics? And if we need to think about it, we can, we can answer this after, after the webinar. Uh, Damien, I, th I think from our standpoint, um, we're, the way we see errors that might not be from, from software are based on the second attorney review and picking up factors like during the prosecution um, scorecard that the second attorney review reviewer fills out, um, we, we talk about we and comment on and give feedback on whether 
our amendment was too narrow? Was it reasonable? Um, did it address, did, does it now bring up 112 or 101 issues? Um, have we addressed all the objections? So during that second attorney review process, we give, that's the way we try to pick up those, those errors that you can't um, come up with or, or um, detect through some kind of software. I think that's what the, the question uh, was, was getting at. Thank you. Well, maybe that's I'll, I'll, I'll take, a, I'll take a, a, br a brief stab at it too. I think one of the things is, um, this is one of the more subjective area, you know, say claim scope or claim terms or, um, you know, support in the spec. Um, all those things are some of the more subjective things that are part of what we do. And I think it's hard in real time to, to measure those and you really need, you know, very high quality practitioners who are well trained have a good review process that will ensure that to be minimized. But over time, you can look at um, you know how many words are in a claim, how many amendments to allowance, and you can start seeing trends that that illustrate the strength of your um, of your process and of your team. So um, while it's subjective up front, there's many things you can do with training and review, and then on the backside. There's, there's, there's um, increasing statistics that you can see that really show um, the, the quality up front. So that's another way to think about it. Right. Well, maybe that's a good transition to um, Jeff, um, your section on his outer visits. Yeah, so um, I'm going to comment on the use of uh, patent examiner statistics in, in the prosecution process. And I'm a huge fan of patent examiner statistics. Um, I remember back when Examiner Ninja was first out, like that's when I learned about them. Um, and for me, you know, one of the first things I do when I pick up an office action response is I look at my examiner. You know, I want to know like what am I up against? Is this a hard examiner, an easy examiner? I think doing that in the very beginning just helps you uh, formulate your strategy better. Um, and there's a lot of free statistics tools available. Um, both PatentBots and Harity have free statistics available on their websites. Um, so there's really no reason not to go check them out and use them. Um, and I think in terms of patent quality, I think the main advantage um, that the examiner statistics give you is that it allows you to get broader claims for your client. You know, you can avoid uh, unnecessary amendments, right? Like sometimes you might make amendments just to get something allowed but you, I think you can make better judgment calls about when you can not do those unnecessary amendments to get better patents. Um, and me personally, I get very frustrated when um, an examiner is not allowing claims that I think my client is entitled to. You know, I really want to get the broadest claim scope I can. And you know, often where the statistics come in is you have a final office action and you need to decide, okay, do I wanna do an RCE? Or do I want to appeal? Like it's one of the biggest questions we have to figure out. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll give one example of uh, a common examiner behavior where I think it's super helpful. Um, there are some examiners who, you know, with the rejection in their final office action, they're kind of bluffing. You know, it's kind of like a poker game. Um, and the way that you can see this is when you look at their appeal statistics, mm -hmm. you know, these examiners will. Uh, essentially change their mind during the appeal process and allow you claims um, without the case going to the board. Uh, and there's a certain group of examiners who do this almost every time you appeal. Um, and you know it's hard to know exactly why, what's going on, but if you can see in the statistics that the result of your appeal is most likely that the examiner changes their mind and grants you claims, like that's super valuable information because I'm gonna appeal uh, at the first final office action, like why wait? You know, might as well just get to it, um, you know, and get your claims a lot quickly. Um, so just one example, and I'm, I'm curious to hear what um, other members of the panel, how they use statistics. I agree with, with, with Jeff uh, about, especially, especially when, you're, when you're facing an appeal, that, that's where I believe the, the statistics are, are really useful. Uh, and as Jeff pointed out, yeah, I've come across many cases where, where an examiner is bluffing. You know, you file the appeal brief and all of a sudden the case becomes allowable. Uh, and that, that, that's good to know whether, you know, because as a matter of fact, a lot of times just do the request for pre-appeal brief review and the case gets allowed. And that, 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 saves, that saves a lot of time. 
Or you can see when they're not going to, you know, sometimes you'll have the examiners just sign on to those pre field brief mm -hmm. conferences and you'll see that they're firm 95% of the time. So what's might as well go straight to appeal in those cases, if they certainly if their appeal record mm -hmm. is, is certain is not as strong. So yeah, well, as, as, as a former examiner, I could, I could say that, uh, almost always my supervisor signed on to whatever my recommendation was at, at the pre appeal brief conference. So that, that it, it really comes down to the examiner in, in most cases. Yeah, and in most cases, I'm seeing that more frequently where there is um, sign on by a supervisor and another examiner to these. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard at that stage. I, I find through, through our use of it. But what to uh, Jeff's point, you know, we use a, we have a patent proofer software. And so our, our patent proofer software adds a crowdsourcing piece to it so that you might be able to have um, someone's kind of subjective comments about the examiner. So we have the objective data as well as subjective. And sometimes it's helpful. Sometimes you'll see something. I'm like, oh, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll the examiner seems amen, amenable to this type of feature. I'll add that and if it's reasonable for, for that particular application. So I like that crowdsourcing piece. I, I, I love when there's a comment and I can, can just get a little, a little more, know a little more, bit more about the examiner. Very good, very interesting. Well, it's time to launch our first poll. So everyone, please do vote. I'm gonna launch the poll now. Uh, you should see it on your screen and then we'll share the results. This will give our panelists a minute to uh, uh, have a sip of water while, while we look at that. Um, Jeff, any further thoughts about um, using statistics? Yeah, I had uh, another example um, that I thought I'd mention, um, sort of the opposite of, of the one that I mentioned before. Um, there's sort of another common examiner behavior, examiner behavior that you see is it seems that there's some examiners who just really want you to file an RCE. Like it seems like maybe mm -hmm. they feel like they're not making the applicant work hard enough if they mm -hmm. get claims right away. Uh, and this is another behavior that you can see in the statistics really easily. Um, so if you're pretty confident that, you know, after you do an RCE, maybe with some kind of minor amendment, um, that the examiner is going to allow your claims, you know then it's worthwhile to just, you know, do the RCE, you know, because you could appeal, but, you know, it's a long, expensive process. Um, so it's just, it's just really nice to be able to predict, um, you know, what's going to happen with the different kinds of options that you can take. Very good. Well, let me end the polling here and share the results. So the question was, which patent proofing, uh, proofing software do you use? Um, and there's quite a spread there. Um, it looks like um, we're using um, Claymaster, Patentbox, so good. Thank you very much for voting on that. And please do use the question interface. It's a lot easier to read than, than chat. So moving along, uh, Michael, I think you were gonna talk a little bit about the in-house perspective in terms of what clients expect for a patent quality. For sure, and, and I think across the board, um, quality and measuring quality is becoming increasingly important to, to clients. Um, we've seen, you know, all clients uh, that, that we work closely with, um, you know, supplement and improve and grow their guidelines that, that um, outside counsel um, are being asked to follow. Um, a significant uh, number are also using uh, objective statistics um, very regularly. So thinking about timeliness, running, um, Patent Optimizer or, or one of the other tools that you're, you're, you mentioned, um, looking at the number of words in the, in the claims and the amendments, there's a lot of objective statistics that are being looked at and you know, uh, measured, and uh, that is gonna continue. So um, ensuring that, that you are in tune with the guidelines and the expectation um, of the clients on, the, on, the, on that front is really important as well. We're also seeing a lot of, of growth in, in subjective Review so in-house uh, counsel are reviewing uh, our our uh, applications and providing feedback and you know on a number of different metrics and um, we're getting the, the, those those that feedback so that's a really interesting uh, development as well um, there are an increased number of patent summits for outside counsel um, that that in-house counsel are putting on. So this is a really significant trend that we're seeing um, uh, from our clients. The, the, other, the, the other big piece that, that we're seeing is a desire to partner with us 
um, so that we can add value and insight and help uh, you know, be an extension of them um, and, and how they, they're thinking about patent quality. So um, the other thing is if the, the, the closer you can get and the, the, the additional value that you can add to your clients outside of just the traditional legal work, but the way that they should measure quality and the things that they should be thinking about and providing insight and, and value and uh, showing how you're innovating, that's an incredible value add as well. So lots, lots of discussions going on uh, with in-house counsel um, on, on these topics. It's really an exciting time, I think. David, I think you're, you're on mute. Any further thoughts on that topic? Okay, so I think Elaine, you were going to talk a little bit more about the tools um, that we've sure. touched on today. Yes. So I talked a little bit about, and I know it was in one of the polls, the um, our patent drafter tool. And um, the patent drafter tool, for those of you who don't know about it, um, essentially is a tool we develop to, to automate certain parts of the patent application, certain non-substantive parts of the patent application. So it ensures the ac accuracy and consistency of these particular parts. Our drafting tool is heavily template driven to make sure that the language that we use in our patent application is consistent and well vetted. So this again is a firm preference for the language we include in these templates and not personal preferences. We have client preferences as well on our um, app drafting templates. Um, the drafting tool can replicate claims to different statutory classes. So that's also beneficial when you're doing continuation claims or drafting your application. Uh, we generate uh, automated abstract and summary sections. Um, it also uh, can create a flowchart in Visio from an independent claim, as well as um, creating a flowchart text from a set of, set of claims. And so I, I know some of you have used it before. It is available for licensing. It's been a great tool for quality, but also for efficiency purposes as well. So we can give the attorney more time to work on the substantive parts of the application, not like copy paste and rewording to make the sure the summary fits. We have these automated sections so that it improves the quality and consistency of our work product, as well as the language that we're using. Uh, we also use software tools to automatically check our uh, patent application for errors. We're currently using Claim Master and Patent Bots. And so we use them at every um, iteration during the prosecution process. So when we draft the application, we use a tool and check it for errors, submit it for 2AR with the work and the report um, during prosecution at every phase, we're using the software tool um, for the working attorney as well as the 2AR attorney, they're, they're looking at the report. Our clients sometimes ask for the report. They sometimes wanna look and make sure that there are no or errors in the um, claims. Um, and even at the notice of allowance, that's our, our last chance to check that everything is um, well with regard to the claims um, from uh, antecedent basis or 112 uh, standpoint. So uh, we're using these tools at every stage through every process, through the working attorney, second attorney review. And it's really helpful to make sure that, and as Jeff mentioned, you know, that we have these higher, highly ranked now, thanks to you, uh, uh, applications in the quality area because we have these processes in place. Any, further, uh, any additional thoughts on tools? Yeah, I think, I think it's helpful to sort of, um, you know, categorize the main types of tools that are out there. And, and for me, I put them in, into three different categories. Um, so I guess we do it sort of in order of the of way you might use them. You know, first of all, there's automation tools, right? Um, you know, it's great to automate tedious tasks, um, you, know, make, you know, make the patent attorneys more efficient. So automation tools are great. Um, you know, proofreading tools, I think are a different category um, because, you know, you just wanna, you know, humans make mistakes, right? And you wanna make sure um, the automated tools will find things that people miss. So it, it's great to use those. And then the, the last category I think is also super important is tools that give you valuable information. Um, and I think we're going to see a lot more of this coming, you know, as these tools progress. But like one example, one example is examiner statistics, like those provide you with, with super valuable information. Uh, but then there's other tools like, um, like at Patent Bots, we have the art unit predictor, where we'll predict, you know, which art unit your patent application is going to be assigned to. And that can be super valuable for patent quality because, 
you know, if you can avoid a business method art unit, that's one of the most valuable things you can do for certain types of inventions. Um, so I think it's just nice to think about those three categories of tools. And I think most law firms should be using all three types of tools in their practice. Very good. We do have a related question. Someone said, how do you address the lack of communication between software products? Or, you know, we do see that. Um, that was a question that was asked. So um, we have you know, bigger picture, but I'll, I'll address that question as well. We have a, a group of in-house developers who work very closely with us, developing a lot of automation tools to help us draft our, our patent applications and, and respond to office actions. So a lot of that linking on the back end between tools, we have a, a group of, of in-house developers that, that help us with that, and that's incredibly valuable. But I think for, for many folks that, that don't have very large teams, there's, there's so many great off-the-shelf products that, 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 that accomplish so much these days at really reasonable costs, and, and um, many of them complement each other. So I think you know, there's a wide range of things out there, and um, you know, hopefully the, the discussion today will, um, and some of these products, you'll take a closer look because it, it really is critical to um, patent quality. Very good. And one quick question. Um, what percentage of false errors should be expected when running proofreading tools? Are there any tips on how to minimize time spent for looking for false errors? So specific question, but I thought it was a good one. Yeah, I guess it's probably for me. <laughs> um, you know, so I mean, you know, false alarms in proofreading results. I mean, that's just sort of the nature of the beast. Like you're going to get some. Um, and you know, when we make our proofreading tool, we work pretty hard to minimize them, but, you know, we intentionally leave some in because if you reduce the false alarms too far, you're going to start missing real mistakes. And it's sort of a trade-off, but I think it's really important not to miss any actual mistakes in the patent. So it's kind of the nature of the beast that you just got to live with some false alarms. Um, but one thing to think about is, um, you know, I modify my claim drafting style to reduce the number of false alarms I'm going to get when I do run proofreading. So, you know, part of it is that you can sort of change your practice in, you know, non substantively meaningful ways to, you know, make the review process easier. Very interesting. Well, so uh, switching tracks a little bit. So, um, so Bernie, I think you were going to address sort of the review of work and yes. who the work is reviewed. Okay, well, we, we, we covered some of this previously about uh, who, who, is, who reviews the work and whose work is, is, is reviewed. Uh, as mentioned earlier, every filing is, is reviewed by, by at least one person at, at partner level. And I use partner level because we have different levels of partners and we also have councils who are all considered partner level. Uh, and uh, so every, every, everything that goes to the office gets, gets reviewed by someone at partner level. Uh, the, the, second, the second issue that was, uh, was being asked, are all, are all clients' work reviewed? And if not, why not? And that, that gets more into client preference. Uh, yes, all work is reviewed before it goes out. Uh, However, and most clients, and this is what I prefer, value our feedback, want us to thoroughly re review the work and you know, want, want us to give them feedback. There are some clients, probably for cost saving measures, who strictly want to give us a prepared response and say, here, file this. Uh, we, we won't file it without reviewing it. But in that case, uh, we would just look for obvious, clear errors, typos, whatever, grammatical issues, or, or if they, and this is why you got to look at this, sometimes they'll cite case law that's wholly inappropriate to, to, to the point they're trying to raise, or, or they'll use one of the bad words you don't use in, in, in patenting, you know, saying that something's obvious or something like that. And that, that comes a lot from, uh, we'll look we'll at those from foreign clients who don't, don't understand English as well, and, and they'll drop drop the old word and call something obvious, like, no, no, no. But uh, we prefer to do, you know, thorough review and uh, because, you know, 
frankly, our our name is on it, uh, and you know we don't we, we we don't want to send out garbage. But as I said, it, it's very client It's it's somewhat client specific because some clients, like I said, just want us to. They'll prepare everything and say, "Here, you just they'll tell us just file it." Which of course we don't just do that, but frankly, the effort is not the review isn't as thorough and. Many times they don't even want our feedback and that's unfortunate, but that's, you know, you have to keep the client happy. Any further thoughts on that from the panel? Just sort of one um, comment from my time. I was also in-house. I was in-house at council at uh, Amazon for a few years. And um, I think review by in-house council is, is quite important. Um, you know, there's different, you know, different companies have sort of different levels of review of their outside counsel. I think there's a lot of companies who don't review their outside counsel's work at all. And it just gets filed with no one in the company looking at it. Um, where at some companies, they do quite a bit of review. And I think Amazon um, does quite a bit of review, you know, more so than, than most, than many companies. And I think just the fact of having, of knowing that your in-house counsel patent attorney is going to review your work product, um, that really motivates your outside counsel to do higher quality work. So, um, you know, for any in-house counsel on the call, you know, I think, you know, doing at least some kind of review of outside counsel work is going to, is going to get you much better results. Very interesting. Well, it's time for our second poll. Uh, this is a multiple choice one, so you can select more than one. I'm going to launch this poll. Please do vote and we'll see uh, what the results are. And in the meantime, so I think, Michael, we were going to return to you a little bit about you know, whether your quality processes today are, you know, different from what they were a few years ago. Thanks, Damien. Yeah, it, you know, um, I think of it in kind of two different ways. There's evolution and there's revolution. On, on you know, our training of our, our, our junior team, um, strategic planning for different applications, our review process, um, you know, our, our guidelines, both for um, in-house counsel specific and client specific guidelines. Our use of those have changed and we've, you know, continued to make, make them easier to use and, and, and um, more valuable. So that's been um, something that's sort of evolved over the last five years and, and um, we invest a lot in that. But what I, I really think the most exciting thing is what uh, Jeff hinted on. We, we have invested a lot and automation um, about um, patent applica application drafting. Um, we have a, something that's related to and, and has much of the same uh, functionality that Heredity does. Um, and that is, has, has really changed the way that many of the practitioners practice and, and provided a lot of efficiencies. And I think that's incredibly exciting. Um, we also have um, automation that we're building around um, office action responses and the back end that have really provided some efficiencies and allowed us to do more for our clients um, with, with, without changing uh, the budget. So, um, you know, I think a lot of processes have evolved, but our use of automation and technology to gain efficiency has really exploded and it's, and it's very exciting what the future holds. Thoughts on that? I agree with Michael. I think a lot of our processes have stayed the same for, with regard to quality, except for the software. That's that's helped move our practice to the next level. And it's exciting to see mm -hmm. as we, at, like you, Michael, we have in-house um, software people who are generating this these automation tools, and um, they're they're finding all kinds of ways to improve our system in the in the prosecution space, in the application space, and also um, just in the general process. Uh, space of trying to have our different systems interact in one kind of central hub. So we're working on that in house. There's a lot of exciting things. And Jeff, to your earlier point about the artificial intelligence and drafting applications, there's just so much growth in that area. It will be really interesting to see in the next five to 10 years where that takes us. Very good. So just sharing the results of the poll. Um, so the top choice is uh, proofreading, a review by a patent attorney, review by client. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll download those and keep those for the future, I think. Um, 
any, we do, I need to catch up on a couple of questions, but Bernie, I think that you were going to talk a little bit um, about um, getting the right information from mm -hmm. inventors, really maybe sort of going back to the beginning of this. Do you have some thoughts on that? Yes. Uh, well, the, 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 first, uh, the first point is that having the right person prepare the patent application, uh, have someone hopefully with the same background as the invention, so they can ask the right questions and and you know understand the invention and if if you don't then you should do a little little google searching and learn about it before you speak to the inventor so so you know the right questions to ask and also following up with the inventor sometimes i many times the inventor will say something that's still not clear get back in touch with the inventor you know find out uh, what what the inventor means you know don't 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 leave anything hanging out there. Make sure you have all your you know all your questions answered. Some inventors are are reluctant to answer. Uh, one of the biggest problems is that the inventor doesn't want to disclose the entire invention because they don't want other people stealing it. And you have to explain to the inventor that under the law we have to write an enabling patent application. And if if if, if there's a critical step to this invention we have to disclose it. Uh, you don't have to, you know, have bullet points saying this is the critical step, but it has to be somewhere in the application. And uh, when, if the inventor is really reluctant and just doesn't want to, then counsel them that they could keep it as a trade secret if, if, if they want to, but let them know that if they want to go ahead with it. They may just be, you know, wasting their money because they're, they're, they're could end up with a, with a fatal 112 rejection that we just can't, get around uh, so the 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 two important things are the right person who understands technology and teaching the inventor what has to go into a patent application David, mm -hmm. uh, just a you know I, I think just to build on that i think it's you know uh, i think as a baseline you have to have talented people managing the, mm -hmm. the um, disclosure calls. I think what's really important from our perspective is also training and creating best practices on a very consistent and systematic approach on how to, how to get the right uh, information so that our applications and what we're doing is consistent across our team. Um, and so we spend a lot of time uh, training on this and talking about it and so that we have a very consistent approach and use best practices. And, you know, many of our um, flow, you know, our flow through different invention uh, disclosures is very consistent per client. And we, we really think, think that this adds a lot of value. And I want to add just one more point to that with regard to preparing for the uh, inventor meetings is just really preparing beforehand, prepare, 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 read the disclosure, mm -hmm. understand the background technology, have questions ready, um, even draft a claim beforehand or a sample figure, because that will make the discussion valuable. And we record them. We do an audio recording so the attorney can be present. I know sometimes if you're trying to discuss on the answer, you're not always listening, you're trying to get the capture what the inventor is saying. So record them. It's, it's great for us to go back and say, what exactly were they saying? And you're not as nervous and you can be in the moment to ask better questions. Very good. Um, we do have a couple of questions. So um, this is kind of open-ended too. How do we manage client expectations to improve patent quality while at the same time there's pressure to reduce fees? <laughs> Anyone want to take that one? I think that um, many of the tools and, and advances that we're talking about today are critical because many of these things were, were you know, were done manually in the past. And the, the only way that you can do that is to leverage technology and, and constantly try to improve that, that process um, because that's what our competition is doing. You know, um, the 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 Herity Holland and Hart that you know the two the two H's uh, we are such friendly competitors and we really enjoy each other but you know we know that 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 is the that's the future and I think everybody needs to embrace investment in in automation and technology there's lots of great off the shelf tools that will work 
but um, it's critical that that you gain those efficiencies. Um, and you know, I don't think salaries are going down. I think um, you know, building costs are not going down. I mean, there's a lot of fixed costs, and we've got to become more efficient. And so the only way to do that, I really think, is is through the use of um, technology advancement. But Elaine, I'd love to hear your perspectives too. I completely agree, Michael, and we shared the sentiments about your firm as well. Um, I, I do think that the future is in automation. I mean, I, I ha often have attorneys coming to me and say, how can you, we draft so many original applications coming out, thousands, and um, how do you, how are you, how are you able to fit the fit fee structure and make, and, and make money on it? And a lot of it has to do with automating the non-substantive parts of our application. Um, it's, it's really, and also having processes in place in addition to the automation tools. Um, having, you know, just because we're so template driven, having access to the templates, having, we have another tool called Patent Searcher where we can pull up search by inventor and technology and pull up the closest application to see, to get ourselves up to speed quicker. Um, so I, I definitely think the future is in automation and software tools. And I think our industry needs to embrace it. That's, that's how you're gonna get better and having processes in place to make sure that you also have a high quality product. But automation, I, I would say number one. Good, very good. Um, there's another question here. How do you deal with foreign firms and applicants whose um, foreign applications are not drafted as well as they could be from a US standpoint? Um, respond to a, to a comment that Michael made. Well, some, some of our clients, some of our foreign clients want us to review their application before filing and, and clean them up. And, uh, uh, but then on the other hand, many get, send us the filing the day before it's due and just file it. And there's really not much we could do at that point. But uh, some, some clients, like I said, want us to review them and clean them up. Damien, could you repeat that question? I, I'm not sure I, I, I understood it. Yes, one second, please. So there's quite a lot of them. It was, I'm afraid I've dismissed the question now. So, but no. the, the, gist, yeah, the gist was, how do you deal with, with applications? I think that have come from foreign firms that have been drafted elsewhere that may not meet, reflect the standards that are practiced here. Sorry about that. I seem to have lost the question. No, you know, we, we don't, we don't, um, we don't do, I mean, we, we are asked by our clients to draft all of our applications. We, 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 we don't do, do Dropbox type of work. I, I don't, so I'm sorry, I can't answer that. Um, there's another, another question. Have any of you considered enlisting non-attorney agents for certain aspects of application drafting or review? For instance, hiring a copy editor. Um, we, we make extensive use of patent engineers and, and agents and uh, you know, have, have have, have, have used a lot of training and um, unique recruiting um, uh, strategies to, to bring in really talented folks and um, have had great success with that. So we, we do use the use patent agents and, and patent engineers, technical specialists uh, extensively. Very good. Um, and then we are reaching the end, but I think we have time for perhaps one more question. Um, Yes, this is an interesting one. So on the subject of examiners, how do you feel about a first claim, this might be very technical, that is narrow and, te and teaches the disclosure versus a set of claims that starts broad as recommended in the MPEP? Uh, I do know that there are um, clients who, who expressly take that strategy, um, where claim one is a somewhat narrow claim um, that describes the invention in more detail than you need. Uh, and then the other de dependent claims are much broader. Uh, and the MPEP, you know, sort of frowns on that, but um, I don't think no examiner is ever going to really call you out on it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it is a pretty good strategy. It's an interesting strategy. I think when you have a narrower claim one, the examiner is going to better understand the invention because it's got more details. And maybe if the examiner is willing to allow claim one, maybe he's more willing to, you know, allow other claims that are broader. Um, so I think it's a strategy that some clients do embrace. Yeah. Very good. Another um, way, can, if, if I could just throw this out, an, another way of doing that is to, in the first application, claim something narrow and then file continuations where you broaden the claims out 
as you go on, depending on, you know, once you get the examiner on your side with the first allowance, go for a broader claim in a continuation. Okay. Um, well, we're reaching the end. Do any of the panelists have, you know, just a last thought about this topic, please feel, feel free to, uh, to, uh, to chip in. And we, we've covered a lot of ground today. Well, I wanted to thank the panel very much for your time today. We know it's valuable. Um, also thank the attendees. This will be available on demand. Um, some of the questions we couldn't get to, we'll try and answer those. And we hope this will be a first in a series of webinars uh, in the future of topics that matter to people. So on behalf of uh, Patent Bots and Harity, if I may, thank you so much panel and attendees today. And we'll be ending the, the webinar. I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you. <laughs>